she asked me to introduce her as she's a research scientist um, and she also runs um, a lot of different tours and she also um, is heavily involved in community con conservation organizations so it's pretty obvious that she is now it's pretty obvious why Rhonda's interested in this topic and wanting to um, to run a session on it and um, with perfect timing um, here is Rhonda now and um, I just um, if someone hasn't already, I'll hello make, everyone. Um, Sorry about all that. Hey, Rhonda. Just trying to make you a co-host so that you can share your screen. It was perfect timing. I just finished introducing you, so it couldn't have gone better. <laughs> oh, thank you, Marie. Okay. Marie also says Rhonda is chair of wildlife tourism in Australia. Right. Over to you, Rhonda. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm also uh, chair of the uh, Scenic Green branch of Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland. We're uh, doing fauna surveys and things in that. So um, as well as I run my own Arikiri Eco Tours with Wildlife Tours and incorporating some citizen science within that. And I'm a research scientist through Griffith University. So yeah, all right, you've probably said all that. So I don't need to say that. I'll go straight into my presentation. So tour operators, nature tour operators, eco tour, wildlife tour, geotourism, whatever, you know, they spend a lot of time taking guests out into natural areas, um, whether it's deep into the rainforest, whether it's easy, uh, easy access uh, places like this just out of the Gold Coast or way out to sea or sometimes even way out, out back. that's one of our own tours, 1,200 kilometres to the west of Brisbane. And uh, yeah, less frequent, I've mentioned up there. We only do this particular tour twice a year uh, because it is such a long way. And also, yeah, trying to balance out when it's not too cold, not too hot, when reptiles are active, but etc. But now the researchers, including postgrad students, often don't have the budget to keep visiting all of these places where the um, tour operators and their tourists are happily heading to. Wildlife parks, the same, wildlife uh, keepers in the wildlife parks uh, <laughs> often have the opportunity to observe animals every day, but they may not have the time to do so for hours. The same applies to staff at ecologists that may be busy working in the, uh, in the dining room, in the office, whatever, uh, doing other things with guests, but not have time to actually observe what those lovely animals just outside are doing. Uh, so they say, oh, this has gone back to the old version, the same one that I gave Janine. It doesn't have my edits. Anyway, uh, there'd appear to be a lot of scope for tour operations and their tourists to uh, participate in citizen science because they're going out to these wonderful places. Some, uh, some tour operators uh, are actually trained in science already. Others can um, you know, work in cooperation with academic researchers. And there's quite a lot already happening out there. There's a lot of people taking photos of whale tails to um, record ind individual whales that are migrating from Antarctica up to the breeding areas um, off the Australian coasts in, in uh, winter. And um, you don't really need a lot of prior training for this. Anyone with a good smartphone can snap a few photos of whale tails and because of the patterns of barnacles and everything they can be identified sent into a central area. Um, divers and snorkelers uh, can do a bit of uh, citizen science for coral watch uh, using a colour chart to note the uh, condition of the corals. That again doesn't take a whole lot of training. Uh, then there's some more intense things like uh, now Noel Scott and I did a uh, survey of sustainable wildlife tourism in Asia and the Pacific for UNWTO a couple of years ago and uh, one of you know one of the sites we one of the projects we chose as a best practice example was this wildlife of the Mongolian steppes. Um, Earthwatch Institute and the Denver Zoo got, get together, uh, got together and um, designed this project and they were in cooperation with local researchers in Mongolia as well, collecting data on Gali sheep, Siberian ibex and a whole lot of other wildlife. 
the uh, the work at the um, volunteers. They pay over four thousand US dollars for the privilege. It's a learning experience that they learn about the wildlife, they learn about the techniques, about the scientific protocol, and they spend a couple of weeks uh, living in a little community way up there on the steps where most tourists don't get to go. And um, yeah, it seems working out very well. And of course, all over the world now, tourists are getting a bit more savvy, a bit more sophisticated, and a lot of them are using using apps, especially iNaturalist, and a lot of bird watchers use eBird. And then there's the Atlas of Living Australia, there's the Fluker post started by Martin Fluker, where there's a post set up in a particular spot where you can just put your uh, camera, take a photo, might be recording um, how the forest is regenerating after a bushfire or something like that. Um, Frog ID, Climate Watch, and there's quite a lot of tourism companies that now include citizen science. Earth Watch, obviously. Lady Elliot Island has uh, well, the Coral Watch and also observing manta rays. Uh, Daydream Island has started doing that sort of thing. There's a, a lot. Um, Bower Station, that belongs to the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. There is a bit of a tourism component because they have shearers' quarters and an old homestead and camping. And every night about 6 p.m., Everyone that's staying there comes in, anyone that's interested, most people that are staying there are there because they're interested in birds. It's a marvellous birding hotspot out in Queensland's outback. And at six o'clock every night they gather and uh, tell where they've observed what birds. So the station has been, has been collecting a marvellous amount of data for years now from uh, how many birds are in which part, uh, in which habitat. It's a very big station. Aracaria Ecotillus, that's my own, and I did put another slide in there, which this is reverted to the old um, version, so it's not there, so I'll just quickly explain. I'm, I'm chair of the Wildlife Preservation Society Scenic Rim Branch. We're conducting uh, quite a massive project at the moment, putting in corridors for wildlife to connect some of the um, lower forest in the valleys, which are not protected so much by national parks and so on. Uh, can I just check everyone's hearing me? Yeah, loud and clear. Can you? Hear me? Great, great, great. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll keep going. Just getting a bit paranoid now. Okay. And um, so, as part of this, we're doing fauna surveys, both by direct observation, morning and night, and also by motion sensing cameras in a standardized way, both within the corridor routes and in the um, Main, uh, hu main hubs of wildlife, where the, where the big reservoirs of wildlife habitat that uh, we're connecting the um, corridors from and to. We're doing this now as a baseline and we'll continue over the years to see if the corridors um, are being successful. So when we start tours again, we had to sort of cancel international tours and then interstate tours even, but uh, yeah, we're going to be incorporating uh, some of these fauna surveys into our overnight wildlife tours for the tourists. Oh yeah, that is there. So why did the, oh, I don't know. That's what I just said. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the uh, corridor project that we're working on. Okay, so now when I've discussed citizen science, with uh, people from Griffith University and from other universities. Uh, yeah, there's usually some problems that come up and of course, and there's various problems mentioned in the literature as well. The main ones that I, that I have said to me is that, well, tourists are often ignorant of scientific protocol. If you say that we're just counting what's in this transect for half an hour and they see something exciting just out of the transect, or just after the half an hour is over, I'll be wanting to put that in. Um, they're often not, ar not around long enough to train and not all will be really trainable. Some of them, some of them are a bit tense and um, uh, some of them just don't have the integrity. They just sort of uh, slack off and make up things or not really measure something properly, etc. I'm not saying this happens. I'm saying these are the sorts of things that are said to me. And yeah, that they are, yeah, I know some of that is um, 
is true to some extent. They may get bored or tired too soon, especially if there's not enough animals or enough action. I have found this myself actually, when I'm taking members of the community out on a fauna survey, and they somehow expect it to be a wildlife tour that I'm going to be pointing out animals in every tree. But no, the point here, we don't know if these animals are in this spot or not. We're here to find out whether they are. And um, yeah, I find a bit of a drop off. They <clears throat> don't turn up to the next point of survey because they're expecting to see a whole lot more animals. Um, and uh, yeah, some, some are a bit disappointed. We don't actually get up close and handle the animals, etc. Uh, when I'm trapping animals, life traps, I can handle the animals and show to people for photos and let them go. I can't, uh, my permit doesn't permit me to let anyone else handle them. Um, yeah, one um, senior lecturer, I said, oh yeah, you, you can't trust tourism businesses. They might collapse or change hands too soon. And yeah, then your data's gone. Um, I have actually tried to follow up when doing that UNWTO survey that I mentioned before, I have tried to follow up on some tour organizations, especially in the Pacific, um, that said they were collecting citizen science data, but you know, finally got onto the institution they're supposed to be working with and haven't heard from them for years. <laughs> yes, on the other hand, there's places like O'Reilly's where they've been collecting data on the flowering and fruiting areas and uh, where the birds are and so on. And that's been going for what, not quite a century yet, but getting close, I think, and it's likely to keep going for quite a lot longer. Um, so yes, that might, that might be a problem that we could discuss in a minute. They may not be able to identify species and might try to bluff. Yes, I've had um, actually not, not tourists, but I've had my um, science students out on field work telling me they've seen a bilby in the scenic rear. I don't think so. I think you probably saw a bandicoot. But um, and one that's come up quite a few times. Ah, oh, but if you're if you're getting all these people doing free work, that's going to put science graduates out of a job, because councils and developers should be paying trained people to do fauna surveys, and now they're just going to be um, using all these folk instead. So, yep, I'd just like to open up now to a. Um, uh, I'd like to open up now to a discussion of these particular problems before we go on to the, the problems from the point of view of the... Uh, now, I, um, Janine, I, I, I can't stop screen share without getting out of this PowerPoint production. Okay. Would you be able to stop my screen share and then we get back into it in a minute? Um, I, can stop it, I can stop it for you, but I won't be able to restart it. Would you prefer me to just read questions from the chat? Um, well, I, I'd like to be able to see people. So maybe let's get out of it and then come back into it. No worries. Um, stop screen share. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. So if, um, yeah, if folk could either write comments in the chat, or put your hands up and speak. Um, and actually, um, Janine, uh, so that I can sort of be watching people, <laughs> would you be able to read out some of the questions that have already come through in the chat? Absolutely. Well, we've got a question already. Um, I'm not sure if it's Mari or Marie. Um, Treadwell. Marie, probably. Marie, okay. Yes. So Marie Treadwell was um, commenting and wondering whether it's possible to actually send um, tourist researchers protocols beforehand in the brief. Um, and Shannon sure. Langford um, added to that and said, um, and perhaps they can um, they can opt in given the prerequisites need to, like then they actually know what they're opting into. Do you have any comments? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and I, I certainly intend doing that with my own tours. And um, yeah, and on those longer tours, like the one I talked about with the Mongolian steppes, um, yeah, that they certainly do that before tourists arrive, and they do more of it once they once they get to the destination. So yeah, that that's um, that's a way 
that's one way out of uh, out of that problem. Um, of course, some may not really understand the protocols, but then scientists travel as well. So do science students, environmental science students, and a lot of people that certainly do have the intelligence to learn fast. So yeah, although this has been, yeah, you know, I think some people that haven't led to us or, um, or not really looked into it have the idea that tourists are a hom homogenous group there, people that come over here for the surf and the sun and maybe um, going out to parties on the Gold Coast and all that sort of thing. Not all tourists are like that, especially the tourists that, that uh, decide to join an eco tour or a wildlife tour or even, you know, just nature tour. Um, you do get quite, a, and we've had, um, we've had professors from Oxford, uh, ecology, uh, ecology professors from Oxford on our tour. We've had um, moth specialists from the British Museum. Um, yeah, we've had zoologists from Thailand, from, yeah, um, all sorts of people travel. <laughs> so, yes, we've got, that, we've that, got that is very a few more. We've, we've got a few more questions to get through, and I see Shannon um, Langford's raised her hand. Shannon, I don't know if you'd like to unmute yourself, maybe, did you want to comment on that particular question? Yeah, I was just, um, just in regards to what we were saying about opting in, and this might this is just a simple suggestion, and it's probably already been considered, but um, to reduce like the bluffing of um, you know thinking they've seen a, a bilby and having not seen one, or or you know that kind of situation, maybe reiterating in those prerequisites that um, like not seeing anything is also very, very useful as well, or, you know, just seeing something that is common is also very useful. That's right, yes. And I, I do try and get that across to people, and especially with this now, um, this, sorry, I'm just recording the chat. Uh, I know it's being recorded as well, but I just want to double check that I've got it. Um, uh, yeah, um, with the corridors, a lot of people are really upset. Oh, we didn't see much, did we? I said, that's good actually, in a way, because what uh, we're doing that we're doing the corridor planting so that the wildlife will be able to start to move through. So if we're not recording anything now, but in five years' time, ten years' time, we do record a lot. That's what's really going to tell us something. So yeah, and uh, even in other areas, if you've got nothing much over here and you've got a lot over there we can then start to ask the question why what is it about the habitat or whatever okay janine uh, uh, thanks shannon and um, janine yeah sure so the next question was from um shannon evenden who asked how much sharing of data happens between the different platforms like iNaturalists and how much what sorry i didn't um, quite share with that Oh, how much sharing of data? Mm, so, how much sharing of data happens between the different platforms for recording the data? I know, for example, that I, I know there's uh, access yeah, actually, so, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, you might be able to answer some of that more than me, and in, uh, in, uh, with some of them, uh, I know um, uh, Atlas of Living Australia and I Naturalist share, da share data. Wildlife Online shares data with. Um, Atlas of Living Australia and so on. So I know there certainly is some sharing. What there often isn't is sharing between tour companies, which is one reason that Wildlife Tourism Australia has started the Wildlife Tourism Research Network that I'll talk about very briefly a little bit later. So other, other questions? But two more. Um, so um, uh, Subana, hopefully I've pronounced your name right. Um, mentions that um, her experience with uh, tour guides is that they're often too busy with the guiding and the hiking and the tourists um, who really just want to enjoy the experience. And do you have any words of advice to change their mindset so that they're more interested in actually contributing data towards iNaturalist rather than just looking and taking photos and that sort of thing? Yeah, well, um, and we're not forcing anyone to uh, do any citizen science. Uh, we're just uh, wanting to assist those tour operators who would like to but yeah we could point out that some of it really doesn't take too much time 
uh, and if you're if you're tourists are just trying to find the butterflies or the fruiting trees or whatever and pointing out to you you can then take a quick picture and send it on to iNaturalist or something um, or record it on your own excel sheet and do something with it later um, so yeah um, there, there, there are ways that tour operators can offer a very uh, yeah can put it in without uh, without taking up too much time from the rest of it. And if people are enjoying seeing that wampoo fruit dove swallowing a, a bangalow palm fruit or something, they might enjoy even more knowing that, hey, this is a good observation and I'm sending this on to Atlas of Living Australia or whatever. So um, yeah, I think if we, if we show them how easy it is to incorporate some of it and how some of the guests will really appreciate it, really appreciate thinking, yeah, I'm doing something important here. <laughs> so, um, sure. um, this might, might just take one more question. I'm not sure how you're going for time with the rest of the session, um, but Anna, Christy, I see you've got your hand raised. Do you want to unmute and ask a question? Oh, it was a comment really about the point you made about how you get some people going, oh, you're taking work away from environmental consultants. Um, so that's a misunderstanding of what is being yeah. done because the environmental consultant has a finite job to do, whereas the citizen scientist is out there, as you describe it, when you're telling the tourists, look, uh, you, you're not here to look for, for a specific thing that I already know is there. You're, we are there to see if we can see that thing. Um, yeah. We've had, there are instances where it is correct that, that, untrained people can take work away from trained people. One example I can give is in seed collection, where the, the local mine, the, the Morse Creek mine, instead of paying for consultants to do seed collecting at the appropriate time, they were just tapping, you know, community members on the shoulder and going, oh, look, do you want to earn a few dollars and come and collect a few <laughs> seeds? You know, so that is an example where a non-trained person can take work away but what you're talking about it, you know is certainly not taking work away from experts yeah and generally too most citizen science projects will have scientists working somewhere in the background or as the lead so um yeah and in bio blitzes there's usually trained scientists and postgrad students and so on in uh, they may not always be paid of course but yeah so and councils and others can be encouraged to, you know, if you're going to use untrained people, so pay a trained person to, um, yeah, to make sure everything is done properly along, with, yeah, as a leader. Uh, yeah, Marie had a comment, I think. Yeah, briefing people about the wildlife or flora, etc. Yes, definitely. Um, and this should be done before they come on a tour. Um, yeah, ideally. It, that may not work if someone just decides today, oh, I want to go on that tour tomorrow. But um, a lot of tours are booked weeks or even months ahead. And there's ample opportunity to, uh, to train people for recognising those few, you can't expect them to suddenly learn 300 different birds that might turn up in Southeast Queensland. But if you have a specific project, like I've got a project on uh, the birds that disperse fruits of uh, uh, seeds of rainforest fruits, and show them pictures of the birds that we're likely to see that are doing that. Um, yeah, so, and yeah, and also explain how it does help in conservation. That's good, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, Shannon, I think, was it? No, Marie, um, yeah. Oh yeah, you do. <laughs> you did mention that I do often take pe people to places like if we're heading out west to see uh, Karawinya National Park, where the bilbies have been doing marvellously with the cat-proof, fox-proof fence, we're not going to see bilbies. So I take people to a wildlife park first, where they do see bilbies in captivity. We talk a lot about the bilbies, I show them a film by the brothers um, about the plight of the bilbies and what's been done for them. Then we head way up west and see the natural habitat of the bilbies. Um, yep. A, P, a PDF that people can download, as Sharon said there, that's great. Um, 
Yeah, nature journals. Yeah, I, I, I went to a, a session at Finnaburra run Paula Peters a little while ago too uh, on nature journals. Yeah, that's good. I'll just go back to share screen. Hope I can start where I left off. Ah, that's the wrong one. It looks good. That's the right one. Oh, not start from the first slide. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. There's not that many slides. So. Yeah. Okay. Problems from the perspective of tourists. Sometimes they'll turn up to something and find, ah, yeah, this is not exactly comfortable. You know, it might be very hot weather if they're digging for fossils in the sun. Um, or, you know, it might be cold, raining, whatever. Um, with our bio blitz that uh, we ran at Tambourine Mountain for um, Wildlife Queensland. It was fine right up to the day that it started. We had three days and it was in absolute pouring rain. I actually gave a talk at one of these conferences on a bio blitz in a blizzard or something like that. And uh, I said, look, um, the take home message at the end is, don't say that, don't say, and then it rained, so they all went home. We, we say it rained, they stayed, and we still found a lot. <laughs> but yeah, some people uh, yeah, complain about the, the dust in the outback, although, yeah, we show pictures of the dust on our website. <laughs> but yeah, well, they complained about the insects or the mozzies, the flies, etc. Don't like the food, they don't like aspects of the accommodation, especially if it's in a remote area, just a little country pub in the outback instead of, or a shearer's quarters or something, um, or they don't like working for long hours. So yeah, there's that sort of discomfort, but yeah, I think you can prepare people by being very clear at the outset, this is not a luxury tour, but some of the, some of the citizen sites are luxury tours, you know, we can go out uh, looking at birds in the rainforest at uh, O'Reilly's and then come back to a wonderful, buffet breakfast in the warmth so yeah they're not all uncomfortable yeah some want to be up close and personal with the animals which isn't always possible um yeah some uh, also yeah just looking through a whole lot of literature recently on this um yeah a lot of a lot of tourists feel you know, they're just being used as lackeys to do a few measurements count a few animals or trees or something and they don't really ha have a grasp of what it's all about. So, yeah, I think that, that is important that um, if you're running citizen science on a tour to explain right from the start uh, why we're doing this. What's the, what, you know, what's the use of doing all of this? Um, actually, I've had a couple of people too that have joined our tour and complained about a um, citizen science tour they were on previously where the leader, um, these people were scientists and uh, the leader wasn't sufficiently trained and they said, oh, this is, that, that, that information is going to be useless. So yeah, there can be all sorts of problems there too. And yeah, um, I've been reading some reports of some of the some tourists that have been on and science tours and said, oh yeah, really excited the first day to be part of all this and then if it's a multi-day thing, Mm -hmm. By the third day, it's not quite so exciting anymore, and I've still got to do all this stuff. And by the fifth day, I've really had this. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Also, yeah, I, I was I was actually giving a talk on citizen science in tourism at a workshop a few years ago, and um, I mentioned that some people would like acknowledgement, and um, one other person, uh, uh, himself a researcher, said, "Oh no, they don't need." acknowledgement anywhere it's just all the fun of participating and what they learn but again different kinds of tourists join for different reasons and amongst them there could be some early career people um some postgrad students who would like some if they've done a substantial amount of help they'd like some acknowledgement in a published paper or just by a letter saying thank you something they can add to their cv um or even just on the website that they can download. And I've, um, with the no sharing of results at the conclusion, I've been a bit miffed at that actually. I've sometimes ticked, yes, I'd like to see the results of this project. 
when I've been, I've traveled in a number of different countries and joined in a whole lot of things and never getting, um, uh, yeah, never getting any response, never being told anything about the results of the research at its conclusion. We've also had people, um, I haven't actually had, oh, had it once on tour. I took, a, I took a flashlight photo of a scorpion and someone said, oh, that might disturb the scorpion. You shouldn't take it. So actually that it quite surprised me because I, I, I took it from behind the scorpion anyway. But I thought that's just rather good that people are caring about scorpions. But I'd never, I'd never take a flashlight photo of a tawny frog mouth or something up close at night. But um, yeah, so sometimes uh, unexpected things come up. And when I've been um, taking ecology students on field work, some of them have objected uh, to, you see the Elliot trap over there that someone's looking into, um, probably just baiting that trap rather than getting an animal out. But yeah, some have objected, oh, you know, you're affecting the animals by catching like, them like this and handling them. So um, yeah, and on the, in the Mongolian steppes, one thing they do is to catch the, um, the sheep in the wild sheep, uh, argyle sheep, argyle sheep or something. Um, they catch them in nets and put bands on the legs and then release them. So yeah, there are sometimes, uh, I don't know if they've had any complaints, but um, it, that's a potential complaint that you're disturbing animals by whatever you're doing to do research on them. I don't think that has disturbed it quite so much as the son of a recent president who paid a few thousand dollars to the government and went over there and shot one of those sheep for a trophy for his war. For his war. <laughs> Any, um, so anyway, if we, if we can now um, just have a, have a bit of a, oh, I'm going to turn off my screen share again so I can see the chat and also see whoever might be talking. Oh no, I can't turn off the screen. Yes, I can. It's off. Good. Thank you, Janine. Hi. Okay, so any any questions from that lot? Yeah, I'll go over the um, first question that we have. There are some interesting comments, but um, Shannon Evenden said, agreed, you know, people definitely want to see results. And how do you navigate communicating that it may take some years before the results come out? Yes, we've got to do that with our corridors project. Um, Actually, our federal minister came out for a photo shoot a couple of weeks ago to one of our corridor planting sites, shook my hand, and I thought, what about COVID? But anyway, um, he, uh, he asked me about the results, and I pointed to the trees. They're, you know, okay, these have grown, but they're still only, uh, since last year, they're still only one and a half metres tall. It's going to be a few years before koalas can use them. It's going to be a lot of years before they form hollows that uh gliders and owls and so on can nest in um so this is a long-term project but yes i explain that yeah to i get it yeah when when a tourist does click a box to say i'd like to see the results it would be nice if at least they did get an email explaining that okay these results will be out in five years time or ten years time or we're going to we're going to be putting some interim results on the web that sort of thing. I wonder if one of the ways to address that is to identify what can be analysed quickly and providing that even though it's not the full results but maybe there is something that can be provided in the, you know within a month or two um, just so that participants feel like they've received something. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I've just gone. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Solve that. Um, uh, yes, yes. Like uh, going back to our corridors program, at least we can um, provide result that um, the trees are growing well and that these animals have already been seen. You know, that could be provided maybe next year. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, that is good to keep people up to date with what is happening. Good. Um, and then there was just, um, comments rather than questions. So if it, anyone's got a question for Rhonda, um, you can either pop, pop it in the chat or, um, you can use your raise your hand 
button and um, I'll invite you to unmute your microphone to ask a question. Um, so there was just some comments. Um, oh, yeah. Michelle, I, I Neil, commented. Sorry, I noticed the one on one of the principles of citizen science. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. And actually I'm, I'm writing a paper of this on this at the moment too for the Journal of Hospitality and Tourism. It's an international journal published in India. And um, yeah, I'm uh, reproducing a, um, a brief account of those 10, pr 10 principles within that. And uh, I've actually asked them, do you mind if I don't submit the article until after this particular conference? Because I'm probably going to learn a few things. And they've agreed to that. Sorry, you were saying, Janine? Oh, no, that's OK. I was just um, I was just um, sharing some of the comments, which you've, you've probably also already read. But um, Michelle was just agreeing. You were talking earlier about how by the fifth day and the longer a, um, a tourism research project goes on, the participants are starting to get worn down and <laughs> tired. And Michelle was commenting that yes. um, it's probably by that fifth day that they finally understand how hard scientists work, especially out in the field as well. Yep. Yeah. Yes, because you do, uh, you do see, uh, seem to get a, a lot of people thinking being a scientist is a high paid, cushy job. You are there behind a desk or in a lab coat or something. And uh, well, even those in the lab, lab coat and sitting behind a desk are doing a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, let's bring it home. So that's all the questions that have come up um, at this stage. Uh, okay, so Shannon, Sh Shannon. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Shannon. Yes, I mentioned Trump's. Uh, so yeah, I met the yes, the guy that shot that um, threatened species, the argyle sheep, that all these wonderful citizen sciences scientists and their leaders are uh, taking observations on, doing research for the conservation. Donald Trump Jr. pays the government several thousand dollars, goes out there and shoots them, shoots one for. <laughs> yeah, I would love to hear the end of that family. <laughs> okay, uh, how do you yeah, maintain thanks. motivation? Yes, how do you, uh, as a follow up for people who are doing, yeah, thanks, Shannon. Okay, um, have others got some um, advice there? I mean, uh, uh, I'll provide people well, while they're sitting and waiting for something to appear, I sometimes provide them with some chocolate or nuts and sultanas or something and um, also say that you know if you do notice anything else happening if you see a nice butterfly or something feel free to take a photo and add some side notes it won't be part of our it won't be part of our um, analysis but it's still useful information so uh, anyone else got some thoughts on that how do you maintain that motivation uh, you can also uh, well sorry I won't do it because I just asked. I'd be curious or if how we... anyone's had any success with that. Hmm. Or someone from the other side thinking, yeah, if I'm going to join something that does get a bit tedious after a while, what would, what's something that I would like in between? Marie um, Treadwell. Some... Yeah. Marie Sorry. Treadwell's wondering, are you specifically asking about long-term projects? Uh, well, this is, yeah, this is, this is one where the tourists do stay for several days. It shouldn't be a problem in a one day thing, because usually it'll be something's just squeezed in between other activities anyway. But one thing about multi-day, you don't have to be at it every day. You could be at, at a, um, a conservation tour yeah. at uh, Lord Howe Island. Um, this is not a research, but it's just picking up plastics from the beach to help the turtles and the seabirds and so on. Darren, Darren, stop talking, love. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, they spend the morning doing the plastic collection. They spend the afternoon going on a lovely hike somewhere and the evening looking at um, educational videos and other just nice videos of the natural history of the area. So, yeah, it can be interspersed with other activities if a particular thing is other boring and you can also have several people together doing a job so they can be chatting to each other sometimes that's not possible if you're trying to be absolutely silent waiting for some shy creature to come along 
But also, actually, one thing that I've been thinking of doing now, I used to do a lot of yoga meditation. And I find just sitting in a forest is wonderful. Uh, when I explained to my students um, at uh, Southern Cross Uni years ago, that for one and a half years, most mornings were spent four hours at a different tree watching frugivorous birds come in and eat fruit. And they said, oh, didn't you get bored? I said, There's a lot worse ways of spending a morning than sitting in a forest and away from, um, away from phones, away from email. And if the birds are not coming, I can jot down notes about other things I'm thinking about, or I can um, watch what the paddy melons are doing. And yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking actually next year of running a short thing on just a bit of yoga, breathing and concentration and meditation relevant to preparing yourself for long hours sitting alone in such situations. Anyway, okay, anything else there? Um, well, Vicky said that the um, serendipitous discovery um, is part of tourism and yes. citizen science and that they're keeping it simple and fun. Um, I don't know, if Vicky, if you'd like to unmute and talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we do have to be flexible on tour. Uh, this is something I've mentioned in my wildlife tourism book. If, so, if you've got a set program, but then something turns up that's interesting over there, yeah, don't ignore it. Yeah, just, just shut that for a bit and yeah, we'll, we can have a look at this and talk about it and then go back to what we're doing. Hi, Rhonda. Thank you very much for your presentation. I was just having a side chat with Noel Scott um, and mentioned how great your presentation was this morning. So hopefully um, we can meet at some point. I'm up on the Sunshine Coast. So uh, oh, yes, and tourist science um, is, is um, uh, an emerging area, but it's critical, as you mentioned, to ensure that you are working respectfully and building strong relations with tourism operators and considering, particularly if you are not the operator, in my case, I'm the researcher, um, and I have a 20 year relationship with our marine um, tourism operators here on the sunny coast. So, um, but, you know, knowing the customer is key, you know, this is business 101 as well. So ensuring that this is adding value to the experience, um, allowing people to make that serendipitous discovery um, uh, and being flexible, as you just mentioned, is absolutely critical because who knows what's going to happen we can't say that we're going to see a whale or we can't say that we're going to see a bilby or whatever um, it happens to be it's an organic experience and quite a few of you have mentioned the importance of um, seeing nothing well it's rare that we see nothing we see you know beautiful environments and we see plants and we see seaweed and we see seagulls and dolphins and turtles and other things associated with our particular experience so allowing them to engage um, on a level that's important to them and keeping it super simple um, is the process that uh, we're engaged with because we're particularly interested in the cognitive appraisal of the experience of um, the tourist scientist so uh, thanks for your talk today Have we lost Rhonda? I think we might have. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> she was having issues. Okay. Well, while we wait for um, Rhonda to rejoin, is there anything else that um, people wanted to add to that? People have been talking with their experiences in other, um, in other projects. Just go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to um, share your experience. Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd add that um, back it's really interesting what was uh, Vicky was talking about the relationships that are needed um, and that's been a theme in the previous days uh, talks you know that relationship building is 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 so important just thought I'd add that absolutely the thing that I'm that's very much so um oh there's only a few minutes oh great hello yes hi <laughs> thanks for that oh. Uh, and um, yeah, I'll just share my screen probably one last time. Um, yeah. 
try and start from the current side this time, yeah. Oh yeah, just saying here that the, um, ah, um, that Wildlife Tourism Research Network, which we're going to um, start expanding again soon, we had to be shelved for other reasons for a few years, where we're putting tour operators, researchers and citizen science in touch with each other. Uh, more about that later, maybe not today, apparently. Um, but yeah, one thing, tourism since COVID, um, yeah, a lot of tour companies have pretty well closed down if they were depending on internationals. How to attract domestic tourists, how to attract people that have already seen a lot of our wildlife, although they may not have any idea just how much of our wildlife they haven't seen. Um, that maybe some citizen science tourists will provide a way of tour companies attracting a different kind of customer. If they don't have a science uh, background themselves, they uh, may, be, may be able to do it in cooperation with an academic researcher. One thing, what whales and koalas people see as exciting, if you're doing research on native rodents or beetles or snails, people may not get quite so excited about those. Um, so, but there's ways that you can find of making it more exciting. So yeah, that's a bit of a challenge. Use a bit of creativity to uh, tell you yeah, this is important research. And even if we, <coughs> if you're not all that greatly enthused about um, slugs or rats or whatever. So, but what are some of the possibilities for Australia? We won't have time to go through this now, but. Um, attracting domestic travellers, uh, especially to regional areas, including remote ones, what kinds of projects, what could involve and attract some of the more experienced people, the people that already uh, have a science background and would like to do something a bit different with a different group of animals, or um, how do we promote work on lesser known animals? There's some wonderful animals out there that I find a lot of Australians have never heard, heard of. And, how do we make projects with little sinks and small brown birds exciting? What are some of the rewards of participation, both during and after the event? And um, yeah, there's also, yeah, what are some of the resources? A lot of apps nowadays. There's a lot of guidelines out on the web for organizing bio blitzes, increasing, as is increasing number of these on the internet. Lots of um, not, um, equipment, night vision goggles, motion sensing cameras. Uh, Isabel Wolf and David Croft did a study and found that people were really keen to go on night watch on uh, spotlighting tours if they could use night goggles just for the novelty of it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a lot of associations now that um, can offer resources as well. And going beyond the training in um, simple task explaining the science behind the aims and methods how the results will be used okay you know, give a greater sense of importance to it all um yeah i think that was it so i'll stop if, or if you could stop me screen i can stop share good okay so any quick last comments because i think we've got a couple of minutes left haven't we Um, one minute left. So it was, it was it was mostly myself. I just made a comment. Um, uh, I work at Mary Cancross Sea Reserve on the Sunshine Coast, and we just had oh, a four-day public event focusing on invertebrates. And it's amazing how many people wanted to come and have a look at bugs and ants and flies good. and good, good, <laughs> all good. that sort of thing. So it might depend on the target or uh, that, that, Yeah, that 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 of, that of course would be a free event with the tour operator have to charge money for their time True. and for the meal they provide and everything and for their travel and for their overheads so the tour operator has to make it sound doubly exciting to get people to pay money to join in i, I might just add to just while we're in that last one minute if you do have a citizen science tourism 
opportunity in your local area and you've got it up on Facebook as an event, please make the Australian Citizen Science Association a co-host so we can share or tag us right. so we can share it because we have a list of events right. on our Facebook page, which yes, so no, no, no. far yeah. we've shared over a thousand events in Australia in the last six years. So please, by all means, we want people to come, you know, if you're looking for something in your area, come to our Facebook page. Here's the one that's, you know, might be near you or might be somewhere else you might want to go to as a, as a, as a tourist. Tourism events are starting to get quite large. Uh, we've have noticed here in Australia with citizen science involved. Well, so, can you want so by all means, please, please add us or let us know and we can help you advertise it on our socials. Yes, and this is something so, we uh, offer to all of our members. Good, good. And I'm going to be also mentioning um, AXA on the uh, Wildlife Tourism Australia website, if I've not already done so, under our research network area. So I think Shannon just asked if we do this on LinkedIn. Yes, we do. Again, tag us, Twitter, LinkedIn, good. Facebook. Good. Um, YouTube as well. <laughs> we yeah, have them all. Okay. The only one we haven't figured out yet is TikTok and Snapchat, but we're getting there. Good. I'd, okay. I'd love to see we'll some, see. some tourism citizen science on TikTok. TikTok? I, I've never I'll used TikTok. Maybe I, should out. Maybe I should find <laughs> out how. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rhonda. That was amazing. Alrighty. So I think um, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll we'll, an, I will just remind people to somewhere. save the chat if they want to. Now is a good time to save that chat. It has been recorded. You will be able to see this later. Alrighty. Well, thanks everyone. We might let it um, let people get back to um, other sessions in the program. And um, Rhonda, will you reach out to participants in some way afterwards? Yes, yes, I'd love to. If, if you give me their emails or whatever, thank you. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, See everyone. You I'm going to stop recording now thank as you. well. <laughs>